Recording in progress. <laughs> My name is Liti Gorosieta. Today is April 6, 2023. The time is 4 p.m. We are at the Pewaukee VFW. I am interviewing Dan, Daniel Buttery, who was born on October 14, 1969 in Rio, Wisconsin and served in Germany, Nicaragua, and Iraqi freedom between 1995 and 2007. Daniel Buttery was a U.S. Army engineer officer in the Army and served as a company commander of C Company 724 Engineer Battalion. This interview is sponsored by the Bell Tower Memorial. So, Dan, could you tell us what you were doing before the military? I actually went to college uh, before I enlisted. And while well, there's a story, uh, it's a little sad, but I'll, I'll share it. I wanted to go in, um, I, was, I was denied service at the age of 10 by the United States Marine Corps. They said I was too young. Yeah. I grew up on a farm and uh, you know, I had three older sisters. And after a while, as the younger brother, you get a little annoyed with having to deal with you know, three bigger older sisters. And we did, it was a, it was a working farm. So it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of work and a lot of activity. Yeah. So when I'd have my frustration points, I'd be like, well, I'm gonna go in the Marine Corps because I have family who have all served new generations. Yeah. And um, I think my mom finally got frustrated with hearing this. And I still remember receiving the envelope that had the uh, Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor uh, logo on it. And I was all fired up. I'm like, okay, here I go. Uh, I went in, opened up the letter and it started out, son, we'll see you in eight years. So I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> I still wish I had that letter. It's, it's somewhere in my files. Yeah. So um, I didn't go in right away. And then when I was in my mid-teens, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and um, I didn't want to go in. I didn't want to stress her out any more than what it was. So I begrudgingly uh, worked on my grades <laughs> and, and brought them up. Um, I, was, I was a student athlete in high school. I mean, if there was such a thing. Um, you know, track and football and, 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 and basketball. And I really was active. Um, so for me, you know, again, having family who had served, maybe that was an influence, but it seemed like it was more just something I always wanted to do. Right. And, um, and she had asked me not to go in and she survived another um, five, five years after, after I had graduated. And um, once she passed away and I graduated the university, I then enlisted. And shortly thereafter so I went in a little bit older yeah. um, with my degree already and again not ROTC which is reserve officer training or, or anything like that I was not in I did do a little bit of when I was at the Uni Uni University of Wisconsin Stevens Point mm -hmm. I did try some of the um, ROTC programs that you can you can try out you don't have to be in the ROTC program and that's a commissioning source uh, so whether you're enlisted or officer uh, the commissioning source is how you become an officer to, to explain that yeah. and there are really three tracks to do that academy like west point annapolis uh, air force academy yeah. uh, rotc mm -hmm. or uh, direct commission and, and so i ended up going through the um, officer candidate school so technically four four paths uh, <laughs> after i graduated yeah. um, my basic training and everything so but i went in uh, in my uh, mid-20s yeah. and uh, they called me grandpa or the professor <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I get all kinds of different names as I was going through basic training, you know, because you're with um, 18, 17, 18, 19 year old yeah. um, young boys or young, young men, I mean, um, and uh, you're, you're more mature and you're kind of going through um, that process. So that's, so I, you know, high school student athlete, as I mentioned, and then um, university. Yeah. And so once, as I mentioned, once my mom passed away, uh, shortly thereafter, I enlisted. All right. Um, what was basic training like for you? Well, yeah, basic training. Um, <laughs> I went to Fort Jackson, yeah. and uh, which is in South Carolina, outside of Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I was there in the summer months, and so very hot and humid, and a lot of rain. In fact, that year, uh, some there was an, quite a bit of an uptick of hurricanes that were coming yeah. through. And so we got hit with a lot of rain and, and, and that additional the storm patterns while we were going through there. And when we were on our field training exercises, our FTX, uh, of course, that's when we got hit with some pretty pretty bad weather. So we were literally living in muddy, it's mostly sand in that area. And, uh, but they also have these uh, sand fleas. Yeah. Um, 
so you don't see them, but they bite you and they're pretty bad. So it was, yeah. Um, I became, I took leadership control fairly quickly because they're going to wake you up early. You're exhausted. Uh, when you show up, uh, they intentionally get you there in the middle of the night. Uh, they're really trying to shock you into this new environment that you're going into. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably would have been fine. Again, I was very active when I was much younger. So I, I, I would have embraced that even when I was 17, 18. But as, a, as someone who was already in my mid-20s and you know, I'd already been, had been through a lot, working and et cetera. So I, I, I embraced the, uh, the opportunity. I, I didn't want to have to be woken up at four in the morning um, without us being ready to, to start the day because you're normally, you're racking out going to sleep at about midnight mm -hmm. and then they're waking you up at four or 4.30 and then you start, start your day. So you really only get about four hours of sleep. Yeah. And of course, what you have to do is you only have minutes to get your PT, your, your physical training uniform on, mm -hmm. which, you know, in summer it's shorts, t-shirts, white socks and tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to have your bed, everything dress right dress. So by the time you get out, and you have to be shaven too by that point. So <clears throat> I finally went to the uh, the overnight guy who was, they keep somebody awake. Uh, uh, nobody's asleep yeah. all the time. Like not everybody's racked out. They make somebody do what's called CP. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went to him one night. I said, okay, here's the deal. Wake me up at least like 10 minutes before we're, you know, when, when we think the drill sergeant's going to come in yeah. so we can start getting everybody woken up because it just becomes chaos in the morning. And, you know, you got all these folks who just are not, they're not used to waking up at four in the morning, right? <laughs> yeah. And so we did that. So we started to work through that process and I still remember the first day. And, and so we were standing at the side of our bunks when the drill sergeant comes in and, you know, they, what they normally do is they'll like kick over one of those metal cans that has garbage in it. Yeah. Um, although there's no garbage in it because there's no garbage. In it. I mean, everything is kept clean. And I remember uh, drill sergeant Hood coming in and, uh, you know, kick the can over, wait, wait, you know, ready to turn the lights on. As soon as he hit the lights, we were all standing at attention at the, at the base of our, our, our bed. And uh, he was initially showed that he was upset about it. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some folks who just were not morning people. <laughs> and so it, it took us a while to get him geared up and get ready to go. So um, eventually they, they found out I was behind that. And um, they didn't punish me for that. I think they started to kind of keep an eye on me. Mm -hmm. And so then they started to push me for leadership role. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say probably two, three weeks into, it's an eight week uh, basic training cycle. Um, they they started to put me in more of a, of a leadership role, mm -hmm. and um, and then with that they have this uh, soldier of the cycle mm -hmm. program because they're always testing you, they're they're trying to shock you right, kind of jar you a little bit mm -hmm. to get everybody bring you down to a base and build you back up, yeah. because what they're trying to do is mm -hmm. incorporate in you this training style where there's no individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean you're an individual, I'm an individual. We, you know we're wired the way we are. Mm -hmm. But they want everybody to have that collaborative team, look out for your teammate attitude. And they really start to build that model using that. So they're, they're breaking everybody down and building it back up together. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very honored to become a soldier of the cycle for basic training, which was a brigade size unit. So a number of thousands of, of and I was a runner, but I was more of a track, like hurdles, not long distance. <clears throat> And I would challenge myself for PT in the morning. And uh, remember, I'm in my mid-20s, which is young, but back then you were still the old, the old, the old guy, in my case, in the unit. And um, I chose to push myself in all the hardest levels. So they would break you up in running teams mm -hmm. and based on your capabilities. So Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, right, A, B, C, D, E. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fastest team was Alpha. And I still remember the first time we were running and or I'm gonna be all hoo hoo, which is an army reference, right? Like yeah. I'm gonna be uh, top notch and push myself. Well, you're running, you're doing cadence. I mean, I had never run and doing doing cadence at the same time. What you find is that really helps you with your lung capacity. Is as you're running, you're breathing, you're 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 doing cadence. You're, so you're singing and and yelling. Mm -hmm. And I started to get sick, yeah. and I was like, okay, this ain't good. So I I started to now we're running in formation too. So it's like four four wide and however many deep. Mm -hmm. And I start to feel like, okay, this is not gonna be good. So I slowly peel out. And now there's drill sergeants all around us. They're just waiting for a sign of weakness. Yeah. And I peel out and I slow down enough to let the unit pass. Yeah. And then I pull back. And then what happens is people will move up mm -hmm. 
and fill that slot. Yeah. So I mean, you kind of, it's always like organic like that. And I went around back here and I still remember two drill sergeants like slowly coming around me as they're running. They're waiting to just tear me apart like I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna drop out. And I leaned over and I lose my cookies. And they all kind of back off, they all leave me alone. And I just keep going so I'm running and regurgitating. And eventually they're kind of like, okay, we'll see what this guy's got. So I didn't quit. Yeah. And that's what they're looking for is, do you have that extra gear in you? And they're gonna look for that in everybody. So working with the team, learning different personalities, because you're going to get, I mean, there's people there from California, Wyoming, Florida. I mean, you're, you're thrown into this large group of all kinds of different people. Yeah. And uh, you got to work, work with the different personalities, you know, African-Americans, Latinos. Um, I grew up, again, already having to go to the university, so I knew a lot of folks yeah. who were not just Caucasian like me, uh, where some people, if they don't have in a race experience, right, yeah. and exposure. Sometimes you have a little bit of that conflict, and it was good to have that diversity and that, and that teamwork as well to build, to build together, but um, it was a good experience, uh, hindsight. Um, I did, at one point, there was a joker in the unit, yeah. and he was always cracking jokes, <laughs> and um, which, he was funny, but you're like, why are you doing this? <laughs> All you're doing is drawing attention to yourself, yeah. the wrong kind of attention. Right. And the drill sergeants were on him all the time. Yeah. Like he wasn't adjusting his attitude. He was older like me too, so he'd already yeah. gone to university. And uh, I still remember one day, um, I got up to use the restroom for one of the classrooms, and he was out, and we were up on the, on the fourth level, and I could see him kind of looking over the edge. I'm like, hey man, what are you doing? We gotta get back in there. He's like, I, I don't know if I can take it anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm like, whoa, 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 what, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And he was literally thinking like, I'm done. And I'm going, no, just stop. Look at me, you know, think this through. You're calling attention to yourself. You're funny, I get it. Just keep that in your head. You know, just crack the jokes in your head till we get through this yeah. and then it's gonna ease. And then they're just, they're just gonna make sure that you're playing along, you're doing what they need to do. And he did that and everything was fine. So it's, it's stressful. I'm not gonna say it's not, but, um, but it also was just looking out for each other. It was another way to kind of just, right? Like anything else in, at school or any other community is, um, you know, just be there for each other as you're going as you're going through life. Yeah. After your basic training, what specialized training did you have? Well, military occupational specialty MOS. I was a 25 Mike. Uh -huh. um, so communications. Uh, I, I really wanted to get into Intel, mm -hmm. and um, so I, they ended up putting me in 25 Mike, which was uh, just a, like a information communications, and um, that was okay. But then when I came back from that that school. Uh, and then I went into the reserves. Uh, I went, actually then went into the Army National Guard back in Wisconsin. Um, I then chose to go into the Officer Candidate School, OCS. So I quickly went into OCS, uh, which was a, uh, a reserve program. So it was a weekend training, two weeks in the summer. And I thought about doing the active duty version where you could go to Fort Benning uh, and you're there for another 16 weeks. And I thought, you know, I'm out, I'm back in the reserves, I'm trying to get my civil, civilian career going. Uh, last thing I want to do is go away for another, you know, three, four months and then come back and try to start all over again. So I, I did the reserve officer candidate program, which is here in Wisconsin, uh, Fort McCoy, and then uh, they send you nationally and so you do your training throughout, throughout the country. Uh, and they bring you together with all these other candidates, uh, officer, officer school, cadets actually, um, from all over the U.S. And so that you're learning to become a, a military leader yeah. with, again, another diverse geographic as well as uh, group, so, yeah. All right. Um, so you served in Iraq between 2003 and 2004. Can you tell us about your deployments before Iraq? Yeah, so once I became a commissioned officer, uh, second lieutenant, um, you then have to branch qualify, which is Army um, engineer, mm -hmm. infantry, artillery, right, military intelligence, whatever branches are. So I qualified engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an engineering degree, but I grew up in the trades. And even I worked my way through college in construction. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought the Army could train me the combat side of things, and I, I had a good grasp on the, the basic construction side. Artillery was after me pretty hard. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, it'd be fun for about a year or two, you know, blowing things up. but. Mm -hmm. Uh, after a while, I think that would get kind of boring. So 
um, I had to go to my engineer qualification school, which is down in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, okay. and uh, qualified engineer. That was a six six month program, six month school. And then immediately when I got back from that, I was put in charge of a platoon, mm -hmm. and we went to Germany right away, like within three months. And we did what's called an overseas deployment for training. So we took a reserve unit, guard unit here, packed everything up, and then they fly you out. And in this case, we went to uh, um, Olensfeld, Germany, which is in southern. And it was interesting. Um, while we were there, the, uh, the embassies were bombed. If you recall that in 1998, you're probably too young for that. But <laughs> I still remember going to the chow hall, and uh, they were starting to pull bodies out of the embassy that had been hit. And um, it was July of 1998. And um, we were hearing rumblings of Al-Qaeda, um, of some of the, the terror groups that were kind of on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, that was an early, an early hit. Um, so we went over there. It was a lot of ODT uh, type training where you're, uh, you're building uh, structures for training purposes. They're called MELT, which are urban warfare. So doing our engineering stuff yeah. uh, that we were trained to do. It was fascinating because there were some major World War II battles that went through that area. Um, it's a U.S. base today, so that was, you had a little bit of sightseeing, but not a lot of time for that. Yeah. Came home, and um, so yeah, that was 98. And then of course, uh, Nicaragua was in um, two, 2002. Mm -hmm. So I started to go down there as a lead advisor uh, in the Nicaragua for a task force Contales, which was the Southern South Command, which is the U.S. is the world is broken up into different types of commands. Uh, South Command is or Southcom is uh, Central America and South America, mm -hmm. and uh, like European Command, UCOM is you know Europe as you would imagine, AFCOM is Africa, and so we would go down there and I'd have to start to plan uh, the mission and what we were going to do as part of this peacekeeping mm -hmm. uh, effort, and so we were going to go in. This is pre 9 11, and start to figure out what we need to do and what support we can give them. Mm -hmm. And as, a, as an engineer asset, we can build roads, we can build clinics, we can build, you know. So we ended up having to um, improve roads coming in. The roads are pretty rough. Um, another unit that, I'm, that I had worked with and gone through Officer Basic Course for the engineer school, uh, he was in charge of rebuilding the road from the, uh, uh, from the Caribbean, Caribbean side in. Uh, to get all the equipment in, so he was doing the road improvement. And once we got there, we started to then build our base of operations, our livable quarters, and then once we got that caught up, then we could start to go out and start to do the construction in the community. So we were building the prefab work for schools and clinics uh, in that space, and it was a perfect connection and precursor to Iraq, yes. because we ended up doing that same type of mission in Iraq yes. one year later. Um, so that was right after 9-11 that we were there um, in between the training and ramp up and then the actual deployment and they nearly canceled our, our mission except we had been so committed we already had a lot of equipment and everything all the planning and the resources had already been invested in that uh, they said no keep going forward and continue that mission and then they were so now we're in Afghanistan units are going to Afghanistan it was just it, we knew we were in a very different environment at that time but the training was great for that because you're preparing to go someplace, mm -hmm. right? You don't know where often, yeah. um, and prepare your unit. I'm a young company commander now, not really that young, but mm -hmm. uh, they advanced me pretty quickly, yeah. uh, in part because of my leadership capabilities. And um, so by, by 30, I was already a, a CEO. In fact, uh, they had promoted me so quickly, I couldn't even put on my captain's rank because uh, they were moving me fairly quickly up through the ranks. There's a time and grade time frame where you have to have so much time doing the job before they can advance you. And I was a first lieutenant in uh, Iraq, uh, I'm sorry, in Nicaragua um, at that point uh, before I could even put on my, uh, my railroad tracks as we like to call the captain bars, which normally a company commander has that rank. So yeah, and then we, uh, we came home and um, February of 2002, and um, a year later, March of 2003, we're, we're going into Iraq. Okay. Uh, I read that you conducted over 300 missions in Iraq. What was that like for you? Busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and some of those missions were very large missions. Right. 
uh, what you get is called an MRN, a mission reference number. Mm -hmm. And that MRN is everything from building a base camp, which this flag is from, mm -hmm. Camp Badger, which was just outside of Nazaria. Mm -hmm. um, it had multiple living quarters, and that was only one MRN, yeah. right? So all the way to patrols. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up working quite a bit with special forces units. Um, as what's called force protection, protecting them, basically being their bodyguards. And um, a lot of their civil affairs work is they go into the local villages and they connect us with the leadership, uh, in this case, the, uh, the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Naheem, and um, we would find out what do they need in their, in their village. Well, most of these folks were not in the engineer corps. And so they would go there, find out it was some type of construction thing, some type of remodeling that they needed, um, whatever, and, and then they'd come back, translate it, and then bring it to us, and we'd have to figure out if we had the assets or the capability to do that. Mm -hmm. What I would do is, I finally just started going in with these special forces folks, um, sit down with them, and then they eventually just left me alone and started giving me the missions, because then we could directly start to work, and know I could know right away, do we have the assets to be able to protect and support that mission? Because you know you gotta have the right tool to do the right job. So and that's kind of what happened. So there were multiple different missions from building a big base camp for operations to live from to um, yeah doing patrols, clearing routes from munitions, unexploded ordnance. Uh, it was the good thing was staying busy. Yeah. Because the last thing you want is time to think about home. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean you're gonna do that anyhow, but. Um, for me, being older, you know, in my 30s already at that point, I was okay, but you get these young, you know, these young troops and they're missing home, you know, as you can imagine. And uh, the most dangerous thing is a bored troop soldier who uh, has time on their hands, uh, whatever, you know, so you wanna, but not just keep them busy to, to, to bother them, you know, it's more like keep them busy, keep them focused and give them purpose. Um, again, most of these troops, most of them had gone to Nicaragua with me, so they had gone to a foreign land. Mm -hmm. Some had gone to Germany, but now we're in the Middle East. I mean, we're in a very different culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept emphasizing to them, you're an ambassador. You are an ambassador. We're all ambassadors here. Mm -hmm. So conduct yourself in that fashion. Treat these folks, even though they're very different than you, treat them how you would want to be treated. Yeah. And then I would do the same thing with the local Iraqis when I could work with them is say, um, I'd have my soldiers come in into the tent and work, sit down with the leadership, and I'd have them bring photos from home of their, of their you know, from Christmas or Easter or whatever, not to get into the religious side of it, but that seeing that this soldier who's on the patrol out here looks mean and has got all these big, ugly weapons, but he's got a child, he's got a daughter, he's got a son, and then can make that connection. I think that was really important because it, it, it gave them the ability, Iraqis, to see, you know, we're all just human beings trying to, you know, make the world a better place in this case. So it was good. Yeah. yeah it was a good life lesson for everybody uh, that was there. Yeah. Um, you were recognized for your services in, in Iraq. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, yeah, we, we accomplished some great stuff. And so with that, you, you will get uh, recognition. And uh, yeah, I mean, brought everybody home. Nobody was killed. Uh, there were some injuries, and we were not in the rear with the, you know, we were not in the rear with the gear, as they say, like, just in the luggage area. We were out front. We were in a very high, high threat, high risk area, and so yeah, it was, it was good. It was, uh, um, I was, I was rated very high by the, by my leadership, um, advancement to, uh, to promote. I was injured in Iraq, uh, severe back injury, and so it ended up ended my career. But it was one of those things where. Uh, they were pushing me to take on the next level of, of leadership and it just never happened because of my injury. Yeah. What would you consider to be the most important contribution during your service since you have done a lot? Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, being a good, uh, being a representative of our, of our country, we've got a beautiful country, I love this place. Um, and, and bringing that forward to these foreign lands where they only know what an American is, right? Yeah. Um, through the lens of media or through the lens of what they're being told, especially in the Middle East, where there's a lot of, I mean, there's propaganda everywhere, but um, 
And most of the Shia who we worked with uh, were, were our allies. I mean, they were our friends. Uh, the Sunni, it's all a religious thing, but many of them were uh, happy that we were here, happy that we were there. Uh, we did everything we could to improve their quality of life, uh, you know, building roads, et cetera. And even asking them, what can we do for you while we're here? And, and also, we don't want to be here forever. I would always emphasize that. This is your country. Let's just get along. Tell me what you need. And uh, we'll be out of your hair fairly quickly, hopefully. Because yeah. I don't want to be here forever. <laughs> you know, and you find out some of these, some of these troops, uh, men and women, all branches, did multiple deployments. Yeah. And I, when I say multiple, I'm talking five, six, seven, eight. I know someone who did like 12 deployments. Now, they weren't all one-year lengths. Like ours early on yeah. was one-year boots on the ground. But... Um, yeah, it's hard. I know some would do like three and back, but then they'd go back again within three months. So it's it was a pretty tough period in our in our service. Uh, you know, you look at from 2000, really 2001, until about 2011, uh, you know, a lot of multiple deployments. Yeah. I didn't do that many. Um, I did do some missions into Korea uh, yeah. as part of training when they were uh, at the end of my career. Yeah. How did serving during the war change you? Was it what you expected? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up not naive, you know, I mean, um, on a farm, you're around death, you know, you, I mean, uh, life is very uh, understood, you're, you're processing a, a chicken or you're, you know, you're butchering something, you, so some people have never been around that, um, so when you get into that chaos of, of conflict, um, I mean, we were in some pretty tough areas, there's no question. And I would say it was expected in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the biggest thing was just how you treat other people. Yeah. And even if our language barriers were there, I, I would often have an interpreter with me, yeah. is you can body language and also sincerity. Mm -hmm. And you can convey that as long as you are being truthful to yourself and to the others and how you conduct yourself. And I think that was a big lesson that I, I would take away from, from that is, it's in a stressful scenario. Mm -hmm. um, most of them just want peace and stability in their own home, mm -hmm. hometown. Um, and so you just gotta look at it that way. There were some bad players that would come in and um, we'd find out about it and other units would and you'd have some of those combat arm scenarios. But yeah, it was, it was um, I thought a great life lesson. Stressful, PTSD of course, you don't go through combat, not carry the stressors, but also just acknowledging it, knowing it, um, and then finding a way forward to, to deal with it. And for me, it's giving back. Yeah. It's, it's continuing that service for and to my fellow veterans because it's, um, it never leaves you. Yeah. What was the transition after your years of service like for you? Did you, did things go back to normal? How did you feel? Yeah, there's no normalcy after that. Um, <laughs> You, you, you struggle to find yourself again because you're a new you. Yeah. And, but what happened was the soldiers that I had served with some years later kept going and deploying. I'm injured, I'm back here at the States. Uh, I'm in the reserve, or I was in the reserve, so I had my civilian career already. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my really good soldiers was killed in Afghanistan. And it shook me, it was, it was tough because he was a young troop, great troop. Um, and it was that hit, that gear hit, and I wanted to find a way to keep serving. And that led me to do something, right? And I'll say this to a lot of folks, if you're struggling, don't just, don't, don't just like think and, and, and not do anything about it. Take action and find purpose, yeah. find a new mission. In my case, I started working on this project called Fisher House. Mm -hmm. um, they're national, they're international technically, but they had stood it up here in Wisconsin. In fact, I stood it up locally, and it became my new mission, my new purpose. And it was therapy for me. And it was giving back, continuing to give back to um, my fellow soldiers, my fellow troops who were, and it was helping them who were downrange because it's a place to take care of their loved ones. If they get uh, wounded or, or severely injured or, or you know, if they're killed in action, there's a Fisher House that. Dover Air Base, where the families stay when they go to receive the remains of their loved one who was killed in action. So I knew being part of that program, it's a beautiful program, um, 
I was continuing that mission. Yeah. And that's, that's an important piece I think all veterans need to understand is how do you give back? How do you keep giving back? Mm -hmm. And how do you take care of your teammates? Mm -hmm. And your team looks different now. We're not all wearing this kind of uniform like this. <laughs> you know, we're wearing, you know, professional attire mm -hmm. um, or blue jeans or overalls or whatever. Um, and you have to look out for each other and you find a way to keep, keep doing that. And I think that's a positive outlet. Um, I read about you owning and operating your own company. What inspired you to start it? How's the company doing? Well, I, I, a lot of veterans going back to World War II will start their own businesses because they find it hard to be in a cubicle, um, constraint, working for someone else. Um, so for me, it was, it was good. It was liberating. Um, and I ran my business for, for 16 years, 15 years, sorry. And, um, but I still had, I missed my mission. And so I recently moved over to become president and CEO of the War Memorial Center in Milwaukee, uh, which is a center that where veterans meet and conduct business. And so for me, it was a way to go back to that service. So even though I was running my own business, um, you can always make money, right? You can always make money. You can do something um, to, to make that bottom line. But if you're not part of something bigger than you, I think that's a miss. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm, we're not independently wealthy, so I, I have to keep working. <laughs> but um, yeah, just just be part of something valuable. Um, and, and whether that's a church, a community, a veteran group, um, and that was an important part for me. So I actually shipped it, and I, and I loved my company. I had a lot of success with it, but I'm kind of in that, that phase now of that continuation of service, which I know sound like a broken record here, but uh, it's an important part of me. If that yeah. mission isn't there, I'm not interested. All right. Um, what do you feel is the most important part about the work you do now? Is it the giving back? Is it helping out who the people that need it? Well, a big part of what we do is educate the community on service. Yeah. Um, understanding sacrifice. And we have a lot, a big education program at the center. And I'm very passionate about that. We call those the mission pro projects, the mission programs. And I think it's important when less and less people are wearing the uniform today, 1%, mm -hmm. um, there are less and less people who are relatives or related to that veteran mm -hmm. or that military person. And so it becomes an issue of um, how do we better explain the continuity of civilian and military and veteran and sacrifice. And over time, you know, you go back to World War II, God only knows, something like 40% of families had someone in uniform or even more were working in a factory specifically to support the war effort. Everybody felt the, the, the effects of this generation of World War II. Korea, you know, it's only five years later, so it's still pretty much the same generation. Um, Vietnam, you know, you're talking about a smaller group uh, in population. And since then, it's less and less and less. I mean, at one point in Wisconsin here, you know, we had over about 650,000 veterans when a lot of our World War II vets were still around. We're down to 350 from that time, you know, probably from about the 80s, maybe the, maybe the 70s era. So we're really talking about a small segment of our population who are defending our nation, yeah. if you can make an argument. Uh, they're the ones who are, they're at the wall, the defensive wall, um, and they're the ones who are going to have to hold the, hold the enemy back if we get hit. And we're relying on a very small percentage. What that means is less and less and less of our citizenry has a direct contact with those who serve. And, uh, you know, part of that is, you know, great if we don't have to serve. Um, we're in one of the largest periods of peacetime um, in, in modern man history because you look at post-World War II, where you had 25 million people in the world die. Mm -hmm. I mean, 25 million people. Major conflict, every corner of the earth. Yes, we had Korea. Yes, we had Vietnam. Yes, we've had these smaller conflicts. But for the most part, this world is pretty peaceful. Don't get me started on Ukraine, right? <laughs> because that, I mean, that's a mess there. Um, but from the global perspective, you know, we, what do we lose? Something like 7,500 soldiers? service uh, marines airmen in iraq and afghanistan over 20 years mm -hmm. that was one battle in world war ii 
one day. So, I mean, uh, and now if you're one of those 7,500, right, your family is devastated. It's, it's, but when you talk about on scale, we're really in an incredible time of peace. So hopefully we're there a lot longer. Um, you never know with where the world is going these days, but um, yeah, it's just, it's how do we, how do we make sure that a, that a, that a generation, your generation in particular, or younger or whatever, that they have an appreciation of um, what it take, what it took, or what it takes, and understanding selfless sacrifice, and still today in Wisconsin, since World War One, we have one thousand six hundred of our citizenry who are still missing in action, gone, never came home, no body. Um, that's pretty intense, and that was pretty much World War One, World War Two, and Korea mostly. I mean, we're down, we have 26 from Vietnam. So, and those families are still with us. They're still missing that loved one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is an important piece only be, only to say, it, maybe if you pique some point of interest to say, I want to learn a little, little bit more about that. Because each story is unique. Each story is different. Um, we will always argue. I will always say, I'm, I'm not a hero. I'm not a hero. It's those that didn't come home. Those are the heroes. What are some of the life lessons you learned from military service? Uh, don't tolerate <laughs> um, liars, uh, uh, anything, anybody without ethics. Um, I'm known to be a pretty straightforward person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very nice person, mm -hmm. but don't cross me. And uh, you're going to know it right away. But because I, I often warn people, warn people, <laughs> I'm a recovering combat commander mm -hmm. because decisions that I had to make or that were made um, could have cost the life of one of the soldiers that I was serving with or around me or a citizen or a civilian. Um, I demanded attention. Not, I didn't demand attention. Mm -hmm. I demanded attention to detail, yeah. right? I demanded everybody be alert, be alive, you know, look around, know what's around you. And, um, I would argue, and my soldiers knew I loved them, but they also knew do it right and, and be, you know, know your game um, because you can avoid someone getting injured or, or killed. And, uh, but I loved them dearly. I mean, I would go to bat for them any day, and they knew that too. Um, and so you can get some of the best troops um, as long as they know, in my case, their leader was, was there to support them. And chew them up. <laughs> a little bit if they were uh, if they were being a bit of a knucklehead. So yeah. we, we, you had those cases, and in fact, I had one. And I'll just very quick story. Um, he was caught stealing um, DVDs in the PX when we were in Iraq and whatever. Again, remember a bored soldier is a dangerous soldier, yeah. and um, I took some. You know, we could do something called an Article 15, mm -hmm. which is uh, a reprimand. Mm -hmm. It costs him a little bit of money, and I just I, I look at him. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, this doesn't make sense. And it shook him to his core. You know, he had a difficult life back home. Years later, I run into him, and he thanked me. He said, you turned my life around. He said, you know, I was, I was being an idiot, but you called me on it. And you made sure I did, you know, did what was right. And he eventually went on to be doing just awesome. I mean, he was in charge of multi-million dollars worth of equipment. A guy who was stealing a CD now had the authority to have oversight of something like $25 million in equipment, all because he said, you know, you squared me away on that. I appreciate it. Like, yeah. So, um, you know, that's a big that's a big takeaway is your impact. What what do you leave behind you yeah. when you interact with folks? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's amazing. In closing, this has been an interview with Daniel Buttery regarding his army service in Germany, Nicaragua, and Iraqi freedom. My name is Michi Gorosieta. The time is. 450. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. 1650 hours. <laughs> thank you for your time, and most importantly, thank you for your service. My honor. Thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for doing this. Great.